So one of the biggest surprises so far in the World Cup has been around the teams that are the challenger teams, the teams that nobody was expecting to win and that how they've performed relative to expect expectations. The most obvious was Saudi Arabia beating Argentina. That was a pretty big shock. And what it signaled to me, uh, in addition to Japan beating Germany, is that often times we are caught in our own little bubble. We are caught in our own confirmation bias. We are used to seeing information that we seek out or information that conforms to our worldview. And sometimes we miss the change. We miss the rates of change. And the FIFA World Cup is a great opportunity to sit down and, and, and recalibrate and, um, you know, see how the world is changing. It's a microcosm into change in the world. And that got me thinking this week. And one of the biggest things that's been on my mind has been around China and the implications of the Chinese economy and how that pans out into global markets. Before I get into China, I just want to touch on Saudi Arabia and Japan. Uh, you know, we do see the football results as surprising, but when you actually have a look at Saudi Arabia, they have a very young demographic. They have um, a large section of their population under 40. And it's a, it's a high growth. It's a high growth country. It's a high growth economy. Um, there's no doubt that the Saudis are enjoying the benefits of higher energy prices. But there's something else happening in Saudi Arabia. There's something else happening to uh, the Middle East and the GCC. There's a lot of reform. And, and we don't see that. You know, we think particularly being here in Australia or being in the US or the UK or, or perhaps less in Europe. But, you know, we, we are very insular. And Saudi Arabia being able to compete shouldn't come as a surprise because there are fun there's a fundamental story there. If you have a look at Japan, for example, uh, being Germany as a powerhouse, Japan is, you know, a uh, hundred odd million people population. And even though their demographics are not as favourable, to Saudi Arabia, there is still a very significant story there. And Japan's economy is the third largest in the world. Germany's, Germany's is the fourth largest. So they are, they are kind of neck and neck from an economic perspective. But my point in the note this week isn't necessarily to compare the football results of countries uh, to their economies. It's to point to the fact that often we are blinded by big themes because of the confirmation bias that we have. And relations in China and the China story is subject to that. Uh, if you have a look at you know China, ever since 2018 when the Trump administration initiated the trade wars and particularly the computer chip wars, uh, it sent a signal to the rest of the world and particularly to um, the aggravated countries like China, for example, uh, that the game and the landscape was changing. And we're now kind of four or five years into that trade war. But the recent G20 meeting, there were hints there that we could be on the cusp of a change. We could be on a cusp of this trade war that the West and China have been in. And the narrative at the moment in markets is very, very focused on China's response to the lockdowns? When will China ease their COVID restrictions? And I actually think that's very narrow-minded. I actually think that that's the wrong way to be thinking about China and it's, you know, it's focusing on something that's very short-term but there's a big long-term growth story at play in China. So if, you are, if we actually have a look at clues from the G20 and, you know, can, can we look to this as a potential shift in relations? Uh, there were signs. Uh, and in a note, I did point uh, to signs coming out of the US around, um, you know, some of the wording uh, around their relationship with China and particularly China as a, as a trade competitor. Um, I do point to recent changing of wording in the UK, uh, the new UK Prime Minister and, you know, changing... Uh, their stance on China from a threat to a competitor. It sounds small, but these are 
the little shifts that happen that can make a big difference. And in the note this week, uh, we talk about, you know, those shifts. Uh, we talk about the implications. And, and we talk about, you know, when China works through the COVID-related issues, and they will, at some point, China will start to work through its, um, you know, COVID zero policy and come out of that. But when they do, there's going to be a very seismic shift and a very important investment implication uh, for China or, or in China and you know China in your portfolio and China as an investment theme. We're talking about the world's second largest economy. We're talking about an economy that's gone through a lot of change and we're talking about an economy that can't be viewed through the Western prism. The, you, you, there is no one story or one narrative that defines China. And what I often say about China is that I'm not a China expert but I don't think a China expert actually exists. Uh, I think, you know, China's economic view is a diverse view and it's a view that should be viewed uh, as a thematic view and a view that's um, multi-year, uh, not necessarily through the same prism that we view cycles uh, in the US, UK or in the West where we're looking for Fed pivots, for example. Uh, China as an investment theme is a, is, a, is a strong theme and being here in Australia, we experience that. Uh, the last mining boom that we had, we saw a very significant impact uh, from the industrialization of China, uh, particularly our bulk commodities uh, were major beneficiaries of that. And I believe that we are in the foothills of the next bull market that's going to be resource driven. And here's why. So let's go back to China and, and let's have a look through and, 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 and form a view that eventually that they're going to, you know, um, improve their relationship with the West in some way, shape or form. That's politics uh, that we cannot predict, but there are signs that that relationship is improving uh, from, from, a, from a very poor base. And then if we actually extrapolate that and say uh, what, what else is happening uh, around the globe, or what we know is that there's a big shift towards localization. So the supply chain shocks that we saw during the pandemic they will reverse and there are countries now trying to attempt to bring manufacturing back onshore. Some of that will be successful, some of it won't. And even that which is successful, you're going to have to have a lot of plants being rebuilt, a lot of raw material, commodities, technology that will probably come from China uh, to enable that localization. So the supply chain might shift, but China's place in that uh chain is not going to evaporate it's still going to be there and underlying this all uh, again very timely there is a, a strong shift uh, towards a greener economy and so a lot of the pledges around the change in the energy transition are still there and they are materializing and china is an important part in that in that pie if you have a look at cars for example purely passenger cars there's something like 1.5 to 1.8 billion cars at the moment uh, on the road around the world that are powered by fossil fuels. And those cars are going to change to electric cars, you know, as part of the, the, the um, emission goals that countries have, have built out. Uh, there's going to be a transition uh, to every part of the way we consume energy. And if you take vehicles, for example, you know, that 1.5 to 1.8 billion vehicles, depending on which number you, 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 you take, it's a very large number. And the amount of electric cars at the moment are, are only about, you know, five to six million electric cars in the market. And so the adoption curve for electric cars is going to be absolutely huge. And who is one of the largest manufacturers of electric cars? China. Uh, not just because they have the manufacturing capacity and the manufacturing technology, but also a lot of the imports, a lot of the rare earths uh, that go into the manufacturing of those cars. China has an investment in that supply chain. And so China's going to go through the next phase of its industrialization. China's going to continue to be a significant contributor to the energy transition uh, by giving us the technology that we need to replace the old technology, the, 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 the dirty technology. With all that in mind, um, uh, I'm looking for opportunities. And, you know, being based here in Australia, I believe we are one of the best place developed 
economies in the world to benefit from this transition. Not only do we have geography working in our favour, but we also have a very uh, different cultural dynamic, particularly in the east coast of Australia. Sydney's population, for example, um, there are parts in Sydney where 15 to 20% of the population speak Chinese. Um, if you have a look at Australia overall, uh, anywhere from 5 to 10% of our population is born in China. And so we have uh, generational change now in Australia that ties us back uh, to the Chinese economy in some way, shape or form. We also have a very top high quality top tier energy and bulk commodity producers uh, that will continue to provide the iron ore, for example, uh, the copper, the nickel that's needed to, to for, for Chinese manufacturers uh, to facilitate that uh, manufacturing into green energy. And we have uh, a government that is perhaps starting to change uh, its turn on China. And geopolitics is a big topic. It's probably too, too premature, but I believe Australia not only has uh, the bulk and energy commodities, but also the agricultural, social uh, services that come along with that. And so being biased, being Australian, uh, I'm very pro-Australia, uh, very bullish and starting to really see this as an important investment theme that emerges next year. And I think China emerges at a time where the US and Europe uh, are starting to slow down, uh, driven by higher interest rates. The US dollar starts to come back, commodity prices start to go up, and places like Australia, uh, New Zealand, and perhaps a letter, lesser extent, but still significant Canada, uh, are likely to benefit from that. Canada still has some issues on the, on the political side of things, but their economy is diverse, and you know these three areas are really interesting to watch. So hopefully that gives you a different perspective, inspired by the World Cup, uh, inspired by being non-conventional and inspired by being thematic and looking through the valley and looking for these opportunities. Thanks for sticking around. We'll be back next week with another note and another audio piece to go with it. God bless.